Right. So we are discussing right now the appointment of the rehabilitation receiver. So who can nominate the receivers which may be appointed by the court? Anyone? Will I audience participation? Can I attorney? Okay, so who who can name the nominees uh, which appoint appointed by the court? Uh, appointment of the rehabilitation receiver, initial receiver appointed by the court, which may not be from the nominee's name in the petition. So another receiver may be appointed after the initial hearing if the court so orders. Choice is discretion discretionary upon the court. Just reading the presentation, my question was, uh, who will provide the names of the nominees? Is it the court or is it uh, the, the, the court attorney? Sorry, attorney. Uh, not the court. So <laughs> the petitioner, <laughs> the petitioner, okay, who want to have court supervised rehabilit rehabilitation will already name nominees in their petition. That's one of the mandatory contents of the petition. So at the time of filing, okay, the petitioner can already provide nominees who it wants to be appointed as the receiver. But those nominees named in the petition, okay, they will not be automatically chosen by the court. The appointment is discretionary except only when uh, the nominee okay, is nominated by more than 50% of the secured creditors and the general unsecured creditors. So that's the time when there will be mandatory appointment of that particular nominee who was chosen by 50% of the secured creditors and general unsecured creditors. Claro? So, whoever is named in the petition as nominee will not automatically be chosen by the court. But if the nominee is one that is chosen by more than 50% of the secured creditors and general unsecured creditors, then that nominee must be Appointed. So the receiver may be a natural or juridical person. So these are the qualifications of receivers if they are natural persons and if they are juridical persons. So a natural person okay, who will be in conflict of interest with respect to the petition and the rehabilitation that will follow okay will of course be disqualified but okay that conflict of interest can be waived okay it can be waived expressly or impliedly by any party who is prejudiced by that particular conflict of interest but in juridical persons if they are to become the receiver they must have no Conflict of interest. So who do we consider as having conflict of interest and cannot be appointed as rehabilitation receivers? So it's in the rules and also in the law. So there is considered to be existence of conflict of interest if the receiver is a creditor, owner, partner, or stockholder of the debtor. If the receiver is engaged in a competing line of business with the debtor, or within five years from the filing of the petition, the receiver was an officer or employee or auditor or even accountant of the debtor. If within two years from the filing of the petition, the receiver acted as an underwriter of the outstanding securities of the debtor. If there is any relation 
whether by consanguinity or affinity within the fourth civil degree to any creditor or sole proprietorship or officer okay, or employee of the debtor. And if there is any direct or indirect material interest in the debtor or any of the creditors. So this receiver, therefore, must be a stranger to the uh, parties involved in the rehabilitation. So remember the parties who are involved in the petition. There will be the debtor and the creditors as well as, well as the guarantors and sureties related to the debtor. So, there must be no uh, who is not muted. Can you please mute? All right. So, that receiver must be a stranger. Must not be interested in any of the properties involved in the rehabilitation. So, if there is conflict of interest, then it should be disclosed. If the conflict of interest are with respect to the nominees who are named in the petition, then the conflict should be dis the conflict of interest should be dis uh, disclosed before their names are submitted for appointment. If the conflict of interest uh, exists or becomes known upon appointment of the receiver, then it should be disclosed within 15 days from the appointment. So if the conflict of interest uh, will arise or becomes known or becomes apparent while the proceedings are already ongoing, then that conflict of interest should be disclosed within 10 days from the time of the knowledge of the conflict of interest. So receivers must therefore have no conflict of interest at the beginning or upon appointment or while the rehabilitation proceedings are ongoing or still pending. So what are the powers and duties of the receiver? So the receiver is considered an officer of the court. And the main task of the receiver is to take charge of the assets of the debtor. And by taking charge, okay, the receiver will have to perform the function, the duty to preserve those assets. At the same time, those assets must be maximized towards implementation, the successful implementation of the rehabilitation plan. So the receiver okay, will be the captain of the ship. The receiver will uh, make the necessary studies, reports pertaining to the viability of the rehabilitation plan. And being the captain of the ship, it will be the receiver who will implement the rehabilitation plan. So there are specific powers and duties imposed upon the receiver. So take a look here at those underlined powers. So it is the receiver who will evaluate the claims against the debtor and can recommend the disallowance of those claims. So the receiver must have unlimited access to the properties of the debtor, the records, and other financial documents pertaining to the debtor. So they have the power to uh, demand production of necessary records to assist them in their functions. So they can uh, gain entry into any properties pertaining to the debtor. So they cannot be denied access to those properties. 
So you can read this in the FRRP. What does FRRP stand for? Anyone? FRRP. If you read the record, if you watch the recorded lecture, what is the FRRP? Uh, it's the Financial Rehabilitation Rules of Procedure. Okay, that's the FRRP. So read the FRRP. Okay, matter of reading. So being a receiver, okay, who takes charge of all the properties and assets of the uh, debtor, okay, that kind of uh, function, okay, requires typically the putting up of a bond. So this bond is a performance bond. The bond is to ensure that the receiver will, will, will perform his functions, will faithfully discharge the powers, duties, and responsibilities imposed upon him by law. So is the receiver entitled to any compensation? So yes, the receiver's compensation will be one of the matters that will be ruled upon by the court after notice and hearing. So their services are not for free unless they waive it. So if the receiver has been acting as such, the has been performing the functions even before the appointment, has been acting as receiver for the benefit of the debtor and he rendered services prior to the conduct of the initial hearing, then his compensation will be based on quantum merit. Question. Does the receiver take over the management of the corporation? Does he take over the board of directors? Or if the uh, debtor corporation has a general manager. Will it be the receiver who will be taking over those uh, functions? So general rule is that no, the receiver will not take over the management and control of the debtor or the petitioner. But one of the powers of the receiver is to recommend the creation and appointment of a management committee. So this management committee will then be empowered to take over the management of the debtor corporation. So what are those instances when uh, the, uh, what are the grounds when the receiver can take over the management of the corporation or in lieu of the receiver, the management committee. So there must be a clear showing of actual or imminent danger of dissipation, loss, wastage, or destruction of the debtor's assets or other properties. If there is paralysis of operation and if there is gross mismanagement of the debtor or if there is any fraud or wrongful conduct on the part of those managing the debtor corporation. So quantum of proof will be clear and convincing evidence. So when the receiver or the management committee assumes management of the debtor, then his powers of management will be in addition to his powers as rehabilitation receiver. So, God na good siya, guys. Anak siya sa ginoo. Nana niya, tanan, si receiver. So, can receivers be removed? So, yes, at any time by the court, either motto proprio by the court or upon motion by the creditors 
which hold more than 50% of the total obligations of the debtor. So there are specific grounds to cause the removal of the receiver. You'll see here it will be uh, the what is common among those grounds is his incompetent. Hmm, incompetence or his lack a uh, failure to perform okay, the duties imposed upon him. So if so recommended by the receiver, there can be the creation of a management committee. So the members of the management committee are also officers of the court. So they replace the board of directors or board of trustees of the debtor corporation. So they have the power to take control and custody of the assets and properties of the debtor as well. So they can overrule and revoke the previous actions of the persons or the body managing the debtor. Okay, they have power to overrule or, or revoke. So being the management committee with the power to overrule or revoke the actions of the previous management, then they will, uh, they are empowered or authorized to review past transactions. So they, they, they can exercise uh, powers, uh, in fact, similar or akin to the receiver. So the moment that they uh, come into knowledge of any fraudulent or illegal act or irregularities committed by uh, any person involved with the debtor or the previous management, then they can investigate and take action. So the management committee are composed of three members, all appointed by the court. And these three members, one of them will be nominated by the debtor. The second is nominated by the creditor. And the third member who acts as chairman of the committee are nominated by both the first and second nominees. Okay, so the third member okay, will have to be chosen by the nominees of the debtor and creditor. And that third member is the chairman of the management committee. If the reason for the constitution of the management committee is because of mismanagement or fraud or any wrongful conduct of the debtor, then it will be the court who will appoint the first member. Qualifications of the members of the management committee. It will be the same as the rehabilitation receiver because they are exercising almost the same powers. So action needed. Uh, uh, what is the what is the required number? of members in order for them to take action, then it should be majority. So two out of three. So can you sue the rehabilitation receiver or even the members of the management committee uh, in relation to their performance of their functions as such? So the receiver and members of the management committee or anyone employed by them are not subject to any action or claim in connection to any act they did or any omission if they made it in good faith and it is related to the exercise of their powers and duties. So they have immunity. You cannot sue them while the rehabilitation is still ongoing right so we're in the post hearing stage what hearing am i referring to guys 
post hearing stage. What hearing? Post the initial hearing. What happens when it is already post hearing? So this time, the main event will be the determination of claims. And how are the claims ultimately resolved? So first, there must be establishment of a registry of claims. So the court will have to approve the registry of the registry of claims and similar to uh, similar to the petition guys the required petition initiatory petition and rehabilitation proceedings uh, this registry of claims in fact need to be published so remember that the petitioner in court supervised rehabilitation must already attach to his petition a preliminary registry of claims. So it is considered as preliminary because upon filing of the petition, if it is sufficient in form and substance, then all the creditors and other interested parties will be notified of the commencement order. So the commencement order and the petition are also published. So anyone who was not notified at that time okay, will have knowledge of the ongoing rehabilitation. So the final registry of claims will have to be agreed upon by the creditors and the debtor. So at this point, canning si creditor, uh, all interested creditors must file their Notice of claim, the verified notice of claim at the time given by the court. So, nag-initial hearing na, naka-file na ang tanan na uh, sa ilang notice of claim. So, gi-finalize na ang registry of claims. This will have to be published. And there is also the conduct of an, an inspection after the period of publication. What happens in the inspection? We will find out later. So after publication of the registry of claims, okay, there can be opposition mounted or challenge, uh, challenges made to that registry of claims. And there is a period given within which to oppose or challenge the registry. So after the uh, period to file the opposition or challenges, it is the receiver who will resolve the challenge claims. And once the receiver makes a resolution, the receiver will submit to the court the list of claims and classify them into disputed, undisputed, and then the resolution of the disputed claims. So the decision of the receiver, uh, once filed with the court, can be appealed. Can be appealed to the same court within five days, okay, from the submission of the decision of the receiver. So you see here, guys, the receiver is very powerful. Nashai quasi judicial powers, nashai power to review. So the decision of the receiver will be appealed by motion to the court. It will be the court who will resolve the appeals. Wala pa nina ask sa bar, pero it's a ripe uh, topic to ask in the bar. What will be the remedy to the decision of the receiver denying a claim or disallowing a claim? It will be through motion filed with the court where the petition for rehabilitation is pending. So what are the report required from the receiver? So it's also a matter of reading, guys. Okay, self-explanatory. See, receiver dapat evaluate niya 
whether or not rehabilitation is indeed viable. So the receiver does not favor the debtor, the debtor corporation. So taking char after taking charge of the assets and other properties and after finalizing the claims of all the creditors, then the receiver must report whether the rehabilitation of the debtor is realistic, feasible, and reasonable. Okay, and there must be substantial likelihood that the debtor will be successfully rehabilitated. Otherwise, the petition should be dismissed and it should be upon recommendation of the receiver. So if rehabilitation is no longer possible, the debtor must proceed to the last stage of its legal existence, which is dissolution, liquidation, and winding up. Excuse me. Uh, let's have a five-minute break. Okay, attorney. Yeah, attorney.